and welcome to This Is Ibrooks. My name is Tommy McIntyre for an exclusive look with Kieran Maguire from the Price of Football and Liverpool University Lecturer in Finance at the recently dropped and published Rangers Football Accounts. Kieran, always good to see you. Thanks, Tommy. I'm uh, I'm in recovery mode, having seen Brighton's first ever victory in Amsterdam uh, last Thursday night. <laughs> and, if, and if ever there was a city in in which they know how to help you celebrate, it's Amsterdam. I think they've done a really good job, though, the uh, you know Dutch authorities in letting your cell be dressed up as it looks like your house. I think that's quite a nice, quite a nice touch. So live, live, live from Amsterdam is uh, is Gary Maguire from the uh, ex-host of the Price of Football podcast, yes. ex lecturer at University of Liverpool, as well, I suspect. But what goes in Hell Amsterdam? Of a is in Amsterdam. Like you. Uh, hell of a resignation letter, I'll tell, I'll tell you that. Um, but yeah, so listen, um, I'm keen that we, your Rangers have just published their um, annual accounts, and that's always a source of interest, not just to Rangers fans, but to fans of other clubs and right across, right across Scotland. It's a bit of an annual event. Um, I've been looking through them, and I'm keen to get your insight as well as we look at some of the, the headlines, you know, net loss of 4.2, driven by some of that European stuff as well, but actually some positive stability within there. I'll pause and ask, what's your highlight read before we get into the detail? Um, the, the results were a bit boring, and a bit boring is actually quite good. I, I guess many fans are going to benchmark against the other club in Glasgow who have had a spectacularly successful year in 22-23. So um, the the gap between the two clubs in terms of revenue, uh, which had almost narrowed to zero, has widened up again. Celtic uh, have had a significant increase in income, whereas Rangers have stayed stable. Uh, Rangers wage bills up significantly because the nature of player contracts is that you get bonuses for qualifying for the Champions League, regardless of actual performance. There'll be, there'll be further bonuses, but you know, clearly they, they didn't materialise last year. Um, so the wages are higher than those of Celtic uh, last year. So I, I guess that will be pointed out. What we are starting to see is uh, the, the player trading model, which I think the club, to a large extent, was in, was in recovery mode for seven or eight years. You know, we have to be honest there in, in terms of the challenges it had you know, a decade or so ago. I think those have been addressed and the club is now starting to generate significant sums from player sales. Celtic have been there for a decade. So there is, there's still a bit of catching up to do. Um, the club's not taking on any external debt. It's, uh, it's reliant upon directors and shareholders um, and they're all Rangers fans. So, you know, one would presume that they've got the best interests of the club at heart. And I think that gives you a bit of additional security and 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 comfort uh, going forwards. Yeah, and I think those key themes are what jumped out at me. That stability, you know, boring. Yeah, you can get drawn into the numbers, and we absolutely should look at. You know, it's, it's never it's never a good place to be losing or making a loss. But actually, there's a risk appetite and a tolerance to some of that as you cycle through different different years. Do think anybody's surprised to hear that European football is a massive, massive driver of um, any balance sheet in Scotland? And as you've said, I'm, I'm keen. To, we'll come back to that. But the player training model, in particular, I think if we look at the the, the year in question, 17.5 million, you know, squad investment number. That's transfer fees, some free transfer fees, and contingencies, etc. That's big spend. So they, you know, the board have went with the went with the club there. James Bisgrove identified player trading as one of the central four pillars of this. Are Rangers just in requirement to accelerate through that now and trying to get into that every season model? There's a big sale as opposed to just once in a while we get a Calvin Bassey who's you know, a standout. Yes, uh, I, think, I think they've got to get it right two years out of three. You know, the nature of player trading is that it's quite volatile. It can be irregular in nature. Um, Celtic have effectively a model where they're looking to generate you know, 20 to 25 million pounds a year. And they've done that very successfully over the course of the last decade. Um, I think Rangers are trying, aiming to replicate that. 
respect it and it makes a lot of sense uh because as you rightly said european football is is essential and people will say well hope you know the revenues down as far as uh, rangers are concerned in 22 23 if they'd had one win and one draw in the champions league revenue would have been higher than the previous season um you know, the, the lack of home games at ibrox you know, because you know that you're going to sell out uh in europe you know the, the fact that there weren't any knockout phase games again that had a, an impact upon match day income these these sort of little things um can make a, a big difference you know if it, i know it sounds harsh but rangers are ambitions last season should have been to finish third in the champions league go through to the, the playoffs and have a good run in the europa league given mm. where they are on the pitch as a club and, and and they didn't achieve that objective so you know that would have been a bit of a a blow in terms of what you would call a stretch budget as as far as the club is concerned yeah uh, i think a lot of people might agree with you on that and uh, finishing third point should we touch on amortization any at any point just just to make you happy the amortization figures are really dull for both Rangers and Celtic. They're, they're they're broadly similar to the previous year, which which indicates that effectively the players are coming in, players are going out. Overall, the the, the total cost of the squad isn't changing significantly. Um, as fans, we all want shiny new toys every 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 six months. Um, but I think the the directors have a have a responsibility. Uh, towards the sustainability of the club, and, and you know sometimes they they have to say that you can't always get what you want. Yeah, yeah, it's good, good model for everybody and every part of life. Uh, I'd maybe draw the attention to you know in those accounts, there's it looks like one point three million uh, compensation for Michael Beale, who was relieved of his duties and his entire staff. You know. Given the nature of modern football and contracts right now, it seems to me like a bit of a positive, actually, that that's a, a relatively low figure. Um, yeah, I, I think it's what, you, what you'd what you expect. Uh, you know, people might say, yeah, it, a million pounds is a lot of money. Um, Antonio Conte got 26 and a half million from Spurs. Yeah. Jose Mourinho has earned 77 and a half million pounds from Manchester United, Chelsea twice, Spurs, Real Madrid for being sacked. Seventy-seven million pounds. Yeah, that's almost the whole of Rangers' income for for a single year. So uh, it's it's the cost of doing business, and in you know, for a club where finishing second is not good enough, it's you're going to have to take. A, there's no there's no guarantees in football, and it's it, it's. It's an irritant, clearly, from the point of view of the fans, because didn't think things didn't work out. Again, if you look at Celtic's account, they got over ten million from their manager going to Spurs. So, you know, it, it could have worked out the other way. Yeah, and we saw that with Stephen Stephen Gerrard. Stephen Gerrard well, exactly. Positive, yeah. I think it's four or five million off the top of my head had come back in as, as he left the club as well. I am interested how much is driven by the straitjacket of domestic TV rights and the way the governing body maybe focuses in on that in terms of not leveraging multiple conversations sticking on one-to-one -one with sky i mean the income is nowhere near what should be projected but i am interested if you've got an insight to this what is the level of broadcaster interest in scottish football well for, for, yeah i'm sure all rangers fans have got far more interesting lives than i am but i follow practically every single football institution when it comes to publishing accounts and the spfl accounts came out last week uh, I think it, the, the total revenue was just over forty million pounds, of which, you know, you know ninety percent is then distributed to clubs. Which means, if you've got you know, thirty-eight, thirty-nine million pounds to go between forty-six clubs, it's not going to be a huge amount of money. Um, and, and it is clearly it, it's also tiered towards where you finish in individual divisions and so on. So it does incentivize clubs. But um, I, I can understand why the Rangers board and the Rangers fan base have uh, frustration that the deal is not worth more. I, I think Scottish football is unlucky to a certain extent, is that it's trying to compete because its matches take place at the same time as those of the Premier League. Mm. And England's a bigger market than Scotland. So when are these matches going to be broadcast? 
because Sky are going to say, well, they're not going to be at two o'clock or 4.30 on a Sunday because that's when we've got our Premier League matches. Um, you've then effectively having to split the market because often you, you know, Sky will be broadcasting at the same time as TNT Sports will be broadcasting a Premier League game. And that, again, eats into the number of potential viewers and reduces the value of the product. And, you know, I, I was surprised that it didn't go out to tender. So you know, I'm, I work with media institutions quite regularly. And I, I sort of put some feelers out and said, well, why wasn't this the case in your opinion? And they said, to be honest, that nobody, nobody was even offering to throw their hat into the ring. You know, if, if the SPFL were prepared to give away the rights for nothing, then yes. They know that Sky do a good job in the sense that you know there are a significant number of matches. Um, they know that the clubs potentially are looking to uh, sell to external markets directly. Uh, if, if you take a look at uh, the SPFL, it, it generates £2 million a year, or just over £2 million a year from overseas broadcast income. If you compare that to the Premier League, it's around about 1.6 billion. So, you know, it's it's 800 times as much. And, and the reason for that is that overseas viewers, they don't want to watch Premier League and Bundesliga and La Liga and Serie A and all of these and MLS and the SPFL. It just, it just doesn't move the dial enough as far mm. as the overseas broadcasters are concerned. So therefore you need to go and sell, you know, have some, some direct to fans package if, if that can, can operate. Um, so it, it doesn't look great, but in my view, there's, there's not a lot of upward potential as far as the Scottish market is concerned, you know, because that lot over Hadrian's wall are the biggest problem in Scottish football. Yeah, I think that's an interesting point, and some of that narrative gets lost uh, in Scottish reporting, actually, that it's just a case of, and I'm no great fan of the governing body sometimes, I have to admit, but the fact that nobody's there actually wanting to write a cheque sharpens that conversation, and it's not as if there's a queue of people uh, looking to do it, but the club has to get innovative. I am interested, just from your, your point of view, not specific to Rangers here, but in terms of that, trying to be innovative with the Scottish game, looking at external markets, selling direct. I think Rangers at one point did sign a deal with Star in India, for example. What would be the next evolution? What do you think? Does either the Scottish game have to get used to this level of income and cut its cloth? Or is there a, a route out of that? I think there's potentially a route out of it for Rangers and Celtic because mm. they are both global brands. Um, but how many people are there in you know, and, and if we're honest it's going to be expat countries you know it's going to be you know the likes of australia and uh, and so on i think where the you know, big markets where you've got uh, uh, you know big scottish communities or ex you know, expat scottish communities um that potentially could be monetized but if if they are second generation people there then the danger is that they become Lionel Messi fans or you know they become Manchester United fans and 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 you lose that so how big the market is we're uncertain yeah there's no doubt that that uh, Rangers and Celtic are are very dominant as far as Scot support in in the Scottish domestic markets are concerned um it is incredibly competitive I mean the other exit route is a European Super League excluding English clubs, which is now, it's being touted around. Um, I'm not sure how much interest there is. Uh, certainly when I speak to my colleagues in Germany, they say that German German fans and G German fans are pretty militant. Um, you know, they're very well organized. They've got no respect for such a competition. You know, they want their clubs to, to qualify on merit. Um, and then there's there's the second issue, which again Rangers and Celtic fans might not like, is that the the European the latest variant of the European Super League is likely to have you know perhaps sixty four teams spread over four divisions, which sounds good. Are Rangers 
going to be in the top division? I don't know. There's a lot of big European clubs who you're up against. Um, so, you know, how would a Rangers fan feel if they're in you know, the second or third tier of European football and they finish six, seven, eight? Because you know, that's something which which the fan base isn't familiar with um, and would be a challenge to deal with. Yeah, and what's more to come from come from that? It's uh, there's always going to be a European Super League creeping about somewhere. Um, as you close one door, another one uh, immediately opens up on that type of stuff. I, I'm interested there. If we go come back to the the accounts, so some people, like I said, will maybe read those and go right. Well, hold on, you know, twenty three point six million record player trading turnover decrease of three point one million net loss four point two. But, and maybe take that as a worry, but actually I'm just keen to go back to and just understand from your perspective that yes, you always want to be in a more positive place, but this sounds like it's just a clarification in some of these numbers of, right, well, you can do so much with retail, you can do so much with VIP ticketing, etc. but until either the stadium was to get bigger and you draw in more income or you get a better TV deal, everything hinges on player trading and European rights money. Yeah, those those are the biggest driver. Um, we, we both know that Rangers fans will fill Ibrox every single match. So can you increase match day income? Well, you, you've got to look at three issues. Capacity of the stadium, that's expensive to extend. Mm. Number of matches, well, you know, make pro get into the knockout phases of Europe. And if so, I, I look forward to, to seeing you come down to Brighton. Um, <laughs> that, on my way somewhere else, <laughs> <laughs> I might I might still be in Amsterdam. Well, we do um, need to talk about uh, well, we do need to talk about Brighton at some point as well because I do want to ask you about Abdel Asima, but I'll let you carry on for a second. Yeah, um, and then you've got average take per consumer per match, or so fan per match. I shouldn't have got to use consumer. I ended up talking like buddy accountant. Um, you know, if, if the club says, right, we're going to put up the price of season tickets by, you know, £200 each, it's going to increase revenue for the club. How many fans are going to turn around and say, well, that's fantastic news? Because, it, of course, it affects them on, a, on an individual level. Um, there's issues in terms of uh, can the, the Scottish authorities have discussions with the Scottish government? Because catering, Spurs make £800,000 a match, a match from catering that includes alcohol now you know, now it i understand that new edmonton house will have a license on match days so you know having a fan zone which is outside of the stadium is i think is quite a smart way of of addressing um a revenue uh, potential booster which which is a positive um but again i think we have to be realistic you know, how much profit is there you're making on each, you know, on each pint being sold. Um, you, know, you, you do have to sell a lot of pints, and I'm sure that they will. Um, but turning Ibrox or the Ibrox campus, for want of a better phrase, from being uh, somewhere where you earn money 25 to 30 days a year to one in which is bringing in you know, a decent amount of income on another 300 days from you know, stadium tours, from having gigs there, from you know, trying to monetize uh, the enthusiasm as, as a tourist hub. You know, mm. that, and, you know, I've, I've not been to Ibrox yet um, you know, until we play you in, in the knockout phase. Um, you better get me a ticket, Tommy, otherwise we're not talking again. You know I'll sort you out, Ian. You know I'll sort you out. Not a problem. <laughs> um, so there are uh, there are avenues, and I think to, to give the club some credit on on a, on a restricted budget, because clearly the majority of the budget has to go on the playing side of things, because that's where fans expect their their focus of attention to be. Uh, I think the club is trying to, to broaden uh, its revenue stream, which is to be applauded. Um, but, you yeah, know, there's, there's it, it's, it's small steps, but they're steps in the right direction. Still a long way to go before that they're bringing in the type of money that they'd like to. Yeah, uh, and I think some of the hampering there is some of the transport links round about Ibrox as well, which uh, 
people listening to this will be very well aware of on match day and and beyond. But the club are trying to uplift that that footprint, uh, as you're saying there as well. So I mean, if I draw us back to right, that puts us into a, a position of we know what the key components are of driving the accounts. We know that the club are doing things. You know, they could be looking at an ex technical director or whatever that looks like. That's been mooted for quite quite a while too. In terms of the loans and the conversion to equity, so my read of that is it's it's good for a flexibility perspective. At some point, you want to get that probably taken off the board, but that's nothing that you need to do relatively quickly. What's your take on that transfer of shares to equity, which happened during that period as well? Yeah, I think it was people uh, it being in a position to increase their degree of influence as shareholders. Uh, by by effectively foregoing their loans and converting them into shares. Um, some of those loans were interest bearing, so th there was a financial benefit to the club from such an approach. And you know, on, on a longer term basis, I think the club wants to get rid of those loans through route A, which is conversion to shares, or route B, which is to, um, you know, to, to be in a position to, to physically pay them off. But you know, I'm, I'm sure you know fans will understand. Every thousand pounds that's paid off a loan is a thousand pounds that's not going into the playing budget. So there's always this balancing act that uh, people need to be aware of and, and trying to get it right at a at a time you know when interest rates are high. So I think you know you have to be honest. Rangers will struggle to to generate external debt because of the historic problems that the club has had. It's it's credit rating. Uh, it's something which will have to be earned. And I think, again, that's what the club is trying to demonstrate to the outside world. So therefore, by having accounts whereby you're losing a small amount each year, you know, that's one way of showing that there's sort of uh, you know, financial prudence being demonstrated at board level. And all of these things you know, start to count towards improving uh, the, the perception of the club in, in, in business terms. Yeah. So, and, and you deal with a lot of organisations. So, you know, Feel free to take this question any any way you wish, but in terms of that rehabilitation of the credit position, rehabilitation of the financial model behind the scenes, etc. I mean, the accounts show that there is a a route forward there, and the club are getting better. But the external market view of Rangers, um, I'm interested if you've got a view on that. The external view is that football is a high risk industry. Mm. Um, you have the fact that 18 out of 20 Premier League clubs are losing money on operational level is indicative of that. Um, lenders are also concerned about their reputational risk in terms of lending to a football club. So I, I, I did an investigation into a, an English club. I used to work in, in the insolvency industry many years ago, many, many years ago. Um, and I did this investigation and the conclusion was the club was living beyond its means. I would say, I said to the bank, this company, this club already owes you a lot of money. It's at the, it's at the upper limit of its overdraft. I think given the circumstances and given the projections I've looked at, administration is the safest course of action to take. And the bank manager said to me, have you put that in writing yet? And I thought, that's a strange thing to ask. And I said, not yet, no. He says, can I have a meeting with you? And I said, shall I come to your offices? He said, no, do you mind if I meet you in a pub? And I thought, well, this is, this is all unusual behaviour. So, so we met in the pub and he said, right, this is all off record. Uh, and that's why I'm clearly not, you know, it wouldn't be professional for me to name the club. Um, he says, this, th this club is... Yeah, we're talking about a club with senior status in England. Um, probably a third of my customers at, at, at the city branch or the town branch um, support this club. They're going to take their business away if I'm seen to be the big bad wolf. Mm. And I'm, I'm, I'm second generation in this city. My, my kids are third generation in this city. They go to school. Yeah, they're age seven and nine they'll get the crap kicked out of them at school because their dad was the person that has closed the club or put the club into administration and the club will have to have the points deduction or whatever it's going to be in terms of the sanctions. So we managed to come up through a, a series of, of off-the-record threats 
to the board of directors to to get them to do certain activities that they didn't want to do but can you see why would you if you're the local rbs manager why would you lend to a football club under those circumstances because you know we're not talking about a club in an individual town or city we're talking rangers yeah you know, and you know as well as i do you know, 45% of Scottish football fans support Rangers, 45% Scottish, Scottish football fans support Celtic, and, and the rest support the other clubs. Pretty certain it's 46% to Rangers and 45% to Celtic. I'm, I'm <laughs> certainly the numbers here, and I'm, I'm not walking back. I'll, I'll, I'll take your word for it. I'll take your word. All right. I think it's just tipped up. Uh, no, listen, I get that. And obviously, I know that you're not saying that there's, there's that level of concern behind the scenes at Rangers. No, no, there isn't. No, there isn't. But, but, uh, but would you lend to Rangers? If if the downside risk was, you know, what happens if, if the worst happens and they don't qualify for Europe one year? What happens if they don't sell a player for two years mm. at, at the levels that we've seen, you know, in the course of, of the last two or three years? Which comes back to the prudence of, yeah, as you say, making sure there's stability within the model, stability within the understanding and then the outlay, uh, to, to your point as well, which absolutely makes, which makes perfect sense there as well. I mean... Drawing to a close in, in terms of the accounts then, so, and I'm happy to take your high line view, but I come back to maybe what we discussed at the very start. And people will go through and pick through them on a granular level all through this. But I think from a high line perspective of, yeah, Welsh never want to be in a lost position, actually, to that credit balance discussion and the fact that the understanding of the model is coming through. These are relatively no highlight figures as far as i'm concerned looking at them would you agree do you disagree with that something we missed yep yep they the losses uh the losses are bearable um i, I would have been more concerned had they not sold players because then the mm. losses would have been not good um they at least the club had sort of a pincer movement in that that they had to pay significantly higher wages in 22 23 which they won't have to do in 23 24 mm -hmm. because the nature of players contracts that there are there are automatic bonuses if you qualify for champions league so so we expect to see the wage bill go down 23 24 will income match the previous season that will be dependent upon the level of progress in europe and it, and it is very much europe driven um yeah, I'll, I'll be honest, finishing second in the Scottish Premiership for either Rangers or Celtic financially is better than winning it because the additional money you get from winning it from the SPFL is more than swallowed up by the bonuses that people get for winning the trophy. So, you know, the, you know, the, the finances of, of Scottish football are, uh, and they're not unique, uh, it's, it's the same in England. You know, the best place to, to finish in England is, is second or third. Um, I look forward it, to you trying to sell that one to uh, Ray, <laughs> Ray yeah, just, yeah. I'm not selling that one. <laughs> no, no, I'm not. I'm, not, I'm certainly. And yeah, as, as a fan, yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm in exactly the same position as any yeah. fan would be. You, you, you have this lifelong contract with the club, and uh, nobody, nobody got, uh, orders a, an open bus tour of the city for being financially sustainable. When I last checked. If they did, Spurs fans would be the happiest fans in the country. <laughs> That's the Daniel Levy effect there. Yes. Um, if anybody listening or watching isn't uh, that doesn't recall this, Daniel Levy's first job in football, ENIC member parachuted into the Rangers board by Joe Lewis when David Murray sold him. I think it was a twenty million pound stake. His place man was Daniel Daniel Levy. So there we go. Take take me well from it. We we created them. To some extent so you're welcome to have some of that listen before i let you go because i know you're a very very busy man and i always appreciate your time talking to me and talking to this ibrox and the range of support two things i want to ask you about Abdi, uh, about sema i should say but yeah well i'll start, I'll start with that I'll, I'll, I'll ask you about sema what's your your thoughts there can we can we snaffle them off you that's maybe the question um well uh, I, I did have a marriage proposal to Taylor Swift, which was rejected. And I suspect <laughs> your chances of getting SEMA have got a similar degree of success. The, yeah, I am a Brighton fan. The, the Brighton model is to recruit players um, 
with a view to bringing them into the first team, not necessarily straight away, but quite often they will have a, a, a pathway um, of more than one year. Uh, now, I appreciate that Seema has just been voted SPFL Player of the Month. Is that correct? He has, yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the nature of the way that Brighton play, it's uh, they, they play with two wingers. Um, they would like to have more than two wingers. Uh, one of our wingers has just got a very long-term injury, so that's not looking good. They, they, they don't need, they certainly don't need him this season, but they've also, Brighton have also got a player trading model. Now, Mitoma's just signed a new five-year contract, uh, but McAllister and Caicedo just signed new five-year contracts a few months ago, and they both left in the summer. So, you know, Brighton are always looking to to bring back players with, with a view to uh, replacing the ones that have left. Uh, by all accounts, he's very good. Um, if Ray Snaffleham suggests that Rangers could potentially get him at a very, very low price, that's, <laughs> that's, not, that's not the Brighton way of doing things, I can assure you, as uh, uh, as Chelsea uh, or our B team, as we prefer to call them, uh, will, will, will attest. Yeah, I think finances might dictate that uh, that we see Seema for one season, one season only. However, we will be going with price of football. You know, and um, Brighton fan says, "Yeah, Seema, stay at Rangers for your career." I'm, I'm certain we can edit edit some of what you just said, Derek. Cobble that together, right? So, thank you. Um, but I didn't want to let you off the the, the phone either, or, or off the call. Not specific to, to Scotland, but I know you've been an absolute driving force behind the requirement for a football regulator down south, and we've seen the government's announcement recently. I, I just wondered what your thoughts were on, on the progress on that. Well, I, th I think you, you have to be honest, is that it, it's a potential vote winner, first of all. And, mm -hmm. you know, we, we are living in a political world. Um, there are... There are issues in terms of governance and financial distribution in English football, which which do need addressing. Um, I don't like the idea of heavy handed regulation. So if it's a light touch, if you if you do the right things by I think there's two things you need to do is to stop the wrong people getting involved in the game because Super League was a stain on, on English football because it was six English clubs that signed up for it. Project Big Picture was exactly the same. It's the idea of concentrating power and money in the hands of fewer and fewer. Um, so having a series of, of checks and balances which discourages the wrong people from entering the game is, is one thing. And also, uh, first of all, acknowledging that the Premier League shouldn't be shackled by regulation, but has a responsibility towards the broader game. Uh, I'm, I'm, I've got a fantastic job. I, I, I travel all over the world teaching and teaching football finance as well. Um, and when I ask students, when I ask, you know, when I'm in a bar or when I'm meeting somebody and say, yeah, what, what's, what, what are the three things about the UK that impress you the most? It's always the same. It's the Royal Family, the BBC and the Premier League. So don't introduce a set of rules which are going to make the Premier League weaker. Um, but provided uh, it is done the right way, um, then there's no reason why the regulator would have to get involved with the Premier League, certainly on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, it's it, We've already seen the threat of the regulator has brought the Premier League to the, the table, being willing to offer more money to, to lower league clubs. Um, and the Premier League clubs themselves will still be uh you know still be fine you know uh, yeah, norwich when they finished bottom of the uh premier league the other season they generate more money from finishing bottom of the premier league in their tv deal alone than rangers make in a whole season despite qualifying for the champions league you know that's that's the power of the premier league and i think there's the opportunity to be a wee bit more generous without weakening the premier league as a product yeah and i think the optics there of norwich getting that and uh, finishing bottom versus what Rangers, you know, bringing in full stop is maybe a a good a good but maybe poignant way to, to end this as well. Kieran, as always, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much for joining me and our listeners on this as I was. Thanks very much for Tommy and uh, best wishes for the rest of the season.